It's Casual Friday. I'm going to update you on my finished objects in Finish It February. And I'm going to talk a bit about knitting reference books. Just like on Technique Tuesdays, I've got links down in the description if you would like to jump right to a specific point in the video. So I have uh, an announcement to make, a question to answer, an update on my Finish It February projects, and then I'll talk about uh, knitting reference books. So announcements. So I have an article in the current issue of Interweave Knits, winter to, no, it's not winter, it's spring. It just feels like winter because <laughs> it's 20 below outside. It's uh, the spring 2018 issue of Interweave Knits and I have an article on stranded color work and gauge issues that you can have when transitioning between swaths of plain stockinette and then stranded color work. So um, it covers both issues with technique that you might have as well as just what are the structural differences between a regular stockinette and then stranded color work stockinette that causes gauge differences and then how you can adjust for that. So if you're interested, uh, I'll put a picture of the cover right up here so that you can identify it. And you can get it, a lot of yarn shops carry interweave knits, um, but I, I think Barnes, well, I know Barnes and Noble does. I, I assume other bookstores that carry a number of magazines would carry it. And then you can also buy it uh, directly from interweave knits, either in hard copy form or in, as a digital download. So this week in the Finish It February thread uh, in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks, somebody posted a, a photo of a cowl that she had woven the ends in. She'd been wearing it for a while. She wore it, uh, I think, over Christmas or something with, with the ends hanging down, and she wondered if anyone else does that. So I want to I wanna show you something. I took it out of the back of my cupboard. This is a sweater that I knit years ago. It's a V-neck uh, sweater with color work and it was one of those patterns where I saw the photo and I wanted to make exactly that sweater in those colors with that yarn. So I did that and um, I could have used my article on stranded color work from the looks of this but um, it had a lot of ends to weave in because this is actually more of an intarsia pattern than uh, a stranded color work pattern because there's only stranding across uh, bits of it and then there's big spans of uh, plain stockinette. So um, there were lots of ends to weave in. So I did really well in the front, weaving in ends. And then you'll see the sleeve has quite a few and this sleeve has quite a few and then <laughs> the back has a lot also. So I just got tired of weaving in ends and, um, and left it there. So I, I haven't worn this recently. It was in the back of my cupboard, but I do remember when I used to wear it, because some of these ends, see how they extend past the cuff, that I would uh, t tuck them back up inside. I don't know why I didn't just trim them shorter, but so yeah, I sometimes wear things without weaving in the ends. So that answers that question. So on to finished objects. So I have three completed projects for this week, and then I have a sub project that I completed. I talked about that last week, how with big projects, sometimes I break things down into smaller sub projects so that I can feel like I'm um, making progress. So that's what I'm gonna share with you now. So the first thing I finished was a pair of socks with a blue contrast heel. I did a peasant heel again. These socks uh, were also one of those projects I was working on when I was um, figuring out how to make peasant heels that would fit people in my family. And I, w I used them in a, in a video, I probably the first video about peasant heels and short row heels and getting them to fit. And I'll, I'll link that up there. Um, and I used these socks in there because one of these I did an afterthought heel where I did not mark where the heel was going to be until I had um, knit most of the foot. And then I figured out where, where I wanted the heel to hit. 
And then in the second one, I did a forethought heel, which is what a lot of people call an afterthought heel, but it's actually, you're actually thinking about it ahead of time where I placed waist yarn at the location where I wanted the heel. So I did one of each, um, just do that, because what I had wanted to do was split this kind of black and white section in half exactly, and I didn't know where it was going to end when I was knitting the first one, so that's the one that I made as a true afterthought heel. Um, and I, so I liked them and I needed to do both the heels and the toes. I wanted to do the heels before I did the toes to make sure I'd gotten the length uh, completely correct. And I like these a lot. I don't, I probably again will send these to my mother because um, I have so many socks I can't fit them in my drawer. Okay, so the second thing that I finished was a reversibly cabled scarf. This is the uh, an item I added to my UFO pile last week when I realized I hadn't woven in the ends or washed and blocked it. So this is um, a pattern that I have on Ravelry. It's my very first pattern. It's probably 10, 11 years old, and I will be rewriting it, uh, reformatting it uh, next month. I'm going to be in March. Going to be catching up on patterns. So. It's, you know, so on both, it's on both sides, it uh, has the XOXO cable pattern on both sides. So whatever looks like an X on this side looks like an O on that side. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is, I think it's the old, yeah, it's the oldest thing in this particular pile. So these are some gloves that I knit for my husband. I started them before Ravelry. Um, so they were, it was an earlier 2007 and my husband uses liner gloves inside of mittens, like when he skis or rides his bike or something like that. And he had a pair that were worn out. And so I said, oh, I'll make you another pair and I'll just make them exactly like this because he said they fit really well. And so I was counting stitches and I was redoing it and I knit one of them mostly. I didn't do all of the fingers. And then I, the color is so boring and uh, I just lost interest in them. So I pulled them out in 2016 and I looked at them like, this is not how I would knit a pair of gloves if I was starting from scratch. And so then I was like, well, what do I do? What do I do? So I tried, tried the first sock, uh, first sock, the first glove on him. And I thought the fingers were a little too short. So I redid uh, a pattern. I kind of traced his hand and I, I made some accommodations and I, I knit the second glove. And I think I had maybe the thumb and half of the pinky knit on the second glove. So I finished that, tried it on him and it fit. And then I realized that the first glove, the hand was quite a bit shorter. Yeah, I had to, so I had to rip out the first hand back to the base of the thumb, knit a little longer, then redo the thumb and all the fingers to the correct length. So they, they, they fit him, but they don't fit him the way I would like them to fit him. But whatever, they're done. So that was 11 years. And he'll use them, so that's good. So those are my three finished things. And then the sub project that I finished um, was the sweater that I started last year. It's this uh, cabled, cabled cardigan. And it, it, I knit the body in one piece. So the fronts and the backs together and the split at the armholes. And I don't know if you can even see what it is. It's, it's, it's a long cardigan. So I was a little worried about, the, I'd make quite a few modifications from the original pattern. And it wasn't until I was getting up toward the armholes that I realized that this had a gusset, an underarm gusset, and that's where the full circumference of the chest, how you achieve that, which I wasn't expecting. I looked and I saw there was no uh, waist shaping. So, and because of the way cables are and with the gauge, I wasn't, and it, it was the whole thing. I wasn't measuring it as I went. I knew I had gotten the correct gauge and I had the right number of stitches and I was knitting merrily along before I realized the sweater was going to gain several more inches in the chest. And the problem was my hips. <laughs> so when I got done with the body, I washed and blocked it. And yeah, yes, it's going to fit. 
And uh, I, I looked at my notes and it said, I'm going to start the sleeves tomorrow, which I didn't do um, because it had been 23 days since I started the sweater and I have a three week tolerance for projects. And I don't know why I thought I was going to work on the sleeves then, but I didn't. So I have knit one sleeve. So the sleeve hasn't been hasn't been uh, washed or blocked yet, but um, I do have one sleeve done. And then I've been taking a break from it for a couple of days while I did some other things, finished those gloves. And uh, I'll probably get to the second sleeve this week and then I'll probably take another break. So I'm hoping to have this done at the end of the month, hoping to wear it in the very last finish it February video. We'll see. Okay, so I have had questions ever since I started ca the Casual Friday videos. People have been asking me about reference books. What reference books would I recommend? So some people are noticing, have noticed the reference books back here and the, that I have principles of knitting back here and then I have other books. And then when I did the office tour, people were asking uh, about reference books too. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about, about knitting reference books in general and then knit general knitting reference books specifically, if that makes sense. So there are a lot of different types of knitting reference books. There are books that are meant to teach you how to knit, like be aimed at beginners and they'll have, here's how you do all of these techniques and then they'll have projects associated with them as you build your skills. So th those are really aimed at kind of beginner level maybe up to early intermediate level knitters. And then you'll have reference books like stitch dictionaries, which are mostly uh, textured stitch patterns. They typically only include color if it's a textured color stitch pattern, like slip st stitch patterns with two or three colors or mosaic or something like that. You don't typically see stitch dictionaries with color work patterns in them unless they're specific the stitch ditch dictionary is specifically devoted to color work so I have and I have them in different places I, probably because I mostly do textured knitting so my textured stitch patterns like all of the Barbara Walker treasury series of stitch pattern of stitch dictionaries and then I have a bunch of things on Bavarian traveling twisted stitch patterns, which I really love. Um, try and look over here and see what else. Uh, um, I have knitting on the edge, which is just borders, but again, it's all textured related stuff. And the stitch dictionaries that I have that are on color work are back here, and they're they're all in my. They're kind of like a category of. Um, Fair Island, like I have the Art of Fair Island Knitting, Traditional Fair Isle Knitting, um, Charts for Color Knitting, Poems of Color. Uh, I have a book on knitted tams, but those are, you know, all Fair Isle. It's like a traditional garment I use for fire, Fair Isle. So the color work stuff I have back here because I just don't use that as, mu as much. Now, I haven't ever seen a stitch, stitch dictionary that was devoted to intarsia, which is the color block. Uh, knitting. Maybe they exist. I have never seen that. So uh, I would be curious about whether or not something like that exists. So so that's one type of knitting reference book. Then you have the type of reference book. I'm just looking at my books here so I can remember what I have that are on um, that are related to designing knitwear. So you might have something specifically about designing sweaters or there's like and there's a series of books uh, by Ann Budd called The Handy Knitter what is she called? The The Knitter's Handy Book of and then it'll be top down sweaters or sweaters or patterns which would include sweaters but also gloves and mittens and socks and hats. Um, and those are patterns but they're written in a way that you can use any gauge and it runs for sizes like from two years old up to extra large um, man I think either large or extra large man so that runs those that whole size thing and and you the information on the stitch count you use is in a chart based on what gauge you're using and what size you're knitting so it gives you basically an outline of a 
of a pattern and then you can swap out the kind of collar or whether it's a cardigan or pullover so there's that kind of design which is a nice way to learn design because you have a lot of the information kind of figured out for you ahead of time and then you can swap in your stitch patterns that you get from your stitch dictionary and then there's just things that talk about design um like figuring out things like sleeves or necklines yourself and measuring and all that kind of stuff so there are a lot of different design type there are books on pattern writing which is not the same thing as designing you can design something and and not know how to write a pattern and you can learn the how to write a pattern without really knowing how to design it's completely two two different skill sets and those two skill set sets are skill sets are different from just being a good knitter so um there's those are the kind of books i have over there and then um then i have things that are by cat by uh knitting types so sometimes it might be a knitting tradition like the fair owl that i was talking about which is stranded color work um but then i've got a book on that's only about brioche i've got another one called shadow knitting which is that um what's the other name for that where it's like from the side where you, you it's like you it looks like a striped item and oh, illusion knitting that's what it's called so uh, book on shadow knitting uh, I have one on twined knitting uh, I have Andean folk knitting I have um, Norwegian mittens and gloves so sometimes the books are about specific type of garment sometimes there is specific ethnic tradition and sometimes it's a combination of that I have um, books that are about like this is no idle hands the social history of knitting I've got knitting around the world that talk shows different um, traditions of knitting it's mostly like a coffee table type of book I've got um, Richard Rutt's history of knitting hand knitting which is really interesting to me um, I got a lot of stuff about Aaron knitting. I, I keep some of the Aaron knitting stuff here. Um, and some of this is reference material, not because it's just a stick dictionary, but because they have historical information. Sometimes that, that historical information is inaccurate. <laughs> like um, this, uh, this book right here, this traditional um, Aaron knitting book talks about um, a lot of the mythology of um, and it's but treating it as if it's historical fact about identifying fishermen based on the cables and their pattern when they you know were drowned and washed up in the shore and that's just a myth um, it's a marketing scheme um, because Aaron sweaters um, first of all no fisherman would ever wear a cream colored sweater and secondly um, they weren't identified by the cable patterns and the fishermen were wore a different type of garment is the whole thing but Alice Starmore has a really good uh, section in her book on the, the history of Aaron knitting and how it was developed and examples of the early the early designs that some inventive knitters came up with so so a lot of times these uh, stitch dictionaries or traditional knitting pattern or traditional knitting style books will have interesting historical information. And sometimes you'll, you'll see a lot of patterns in there, but you'll also um, have a reference section that will explain how to design that sort of thing yourself. So um, what else? Uh, that's probably, you know, there's tons of different kinds of reference and, and like I said a lot of them bleed over into each other but then you have the general knitting reference book and those um, can vary quite a bit not even just in their quality but in the depth and breadth of the material and the ease at which they can be used so uh, when I learned to knit I learned to knit from the knit kit which I showed in that this first casual Friday and it was a decent size reference book and so I used it to learn to knit so I didn't understand that there might be some use or utility behind um, having a general knitting um, book I just thought well I know how to knit I can follow the directions and the pattern why would I need a general 
knitting reference book. But for the Master Hand Knitting Program, when you first get your information packet, they include a bibliography of just tons of knitting reference books. And they're kind of by category, sort of like how I described them here. And when, so for every swatch, every question you answer, every report you write, anything that you do, anything you're submitting to them has to have at least one reference cited. Sometimes you have to have multiple reference references. So, um, so then that's the first thing a lot of people have to do when they when they start the master hand knitting program is they have to buy some general knitting reference books and, and they're always looking for advice. So uh, when I joined it was before Ravelry and but the Knitting Guild Association did have online forums uh, for members and then there was a section of the forums that were for people who were going through the master hand knitting program. And so everybody was asking like, what which books do you get? How many do we need? And so there were a handful of books that came up over and over and over again as really good reference books. Now I have all five of those now, but I didn't get all five at the beginning. One of them was not in print. Principles of Knitting, um, the first edition had been out of print for years and there was rumors that it was going to come, a second edition was going to come out, but it kept getting pushed back. So you just, I, I'd given up on the idea that I would ever own a copy of it and that it would ever, a new edition would ever come out because there's Herbie. So used copies of the principles of knitting at that time were like 300, $350. So there's no way I was going to buy one of those. So then that left four books. And one of them was Vogue Knitting, Ultimate Knitting Book which I have here and it came with a book jacket, which I don't have, but it's a, a fairly uh, big book. It's like, and it, and it lays flat. So it's the kind of thing where if you have it on your table, you can look at it and it, it will lay flat. It has a combination of drawings uh, and also photographs, depending on what the techniques are. Um, so that was one book. Another book was, um, Reader's Digest, uh, Knitter's Handbook by Monty Stanley. I think it's Montse, uh, M-O-N-T-S-E. Um, that was one that people recommended. Then there was um, The Knitter's Book of Finishing Techniques by Nancy Wiseman, which is quite a bit smaller than either of the other two. Um, but it fits in your knitting bag. So it has a spiral binding and it will, it will lay flat if you need it to. So, um, and then the fourth one that people commented about was this book called Big Book of Knitting by Katharina Buss. So uh, I wanna talk about the three that I got right away and then I'll talk about Big Book of Knitting. So the Vogue Ultimate Knitting Book, it, that one is out of print now. I believe it was replaced, and I don't know if it's still on print, but I believe it was replaced by um, Vogue Knitting Encyclopedia of Knitting, uh, which I don't know when that one came out. It came out probably eight years ago or seven, eight years ago maybe, and it's about the same size, but it when I looked through it, it was quite different. So Vogue Knitting Ultimate Knitting Book may or may not still be available used in different places. Um, and this book, it really does aim to be sort of an all-inclusive book aimed at uh, beginning knitters up through people who are designing. It's got a small stitch dictionary in there. It has patterns that are modular patterns. So in the, in the same vein as the Ann Bud, Bud books, but not quite the same, not in that same style of how you plug numbers in, but it has a lot of information on different types of necklines and pockets and finishing details that you might want to swap in and out of different sweaters. Um, and then it has all these chapters on various techniques like casting on and binding off and increases and decreases. And for some techniques, I think it's really good. Like I, I it was, it was the book that I learned how to graft uh, garter stitch, I think, um, because I couldn't find that specific information anywhere else. So it's really good for some things. The, the bit about decreases is terrible. <laughs> like it's, it's like if you needed to learn about decreases, I would never go to this book. Um, it, 
it doesn't tell you when one decrease is a mirror of another one. It doesn't tell, it doesn't always have the mirror for another decrease. It doesn't tell you if it's twisted or untwisted. It doesn't, and I don't believe it even has the um, decreases on the pearl side. It's just that particular section is really weak. Um, they don't make any attempt to use the name, the common names that are used for decreases um, or increases. They call them version A, version B. So there's no way, if you needed to look something up because you didn't know how to do it, you wouldn't be able to use that, this book for decreases. But to some extent, that's true for a lot of knitting reference books. They don't, they, they'll have a chapter on decreases and they may even tell you what's mirrored and what's not and what's twisted and what's not. But they don't always give you the common names for those techniques. So that can be a challenge when you're trying to look things up in any book. Now, the Knitter's Book of Finishing Techniques, when I got this book, I was, at first I was horribly disappointed in it because I was flipping through it. I didn't read the beginning. I was just flipping through it. And I'm like, how are increases and decreases and cast on methods finishing techniques? That doesn't make any sense. And then I, you know, re started reading the, the beginning information and I realized, oh, if you want a really good finished result, you need to plan for that before you cast on and you need to pick the right cast on and then you have to have the right decreases and in increases and you have to place them in the correct place. So this is a really good book for, I would say, beginners to intermediate knitters because it has... 90 to 95% of any technique that will ever be called for in a given knitting pattern is probably in here. Now, it's probably not the most finessed version of certain techniques, but it will ha it has, you know, long tail cast on, cable cast on. It has, I believe it has knitting on. It has a crochet cast on. It has provisional cast on. So it has things that are used, mo at least it has one version of, a, of just about any technique like that. Um, so, you know, it has a vertical buttonhole, a horizontal buttonhole, and a yarn over buttonhole. But it doesn't, again, finesse it to get the best possible result, just sort of the most common result. But what it does do is it gives you the advantages and disadvantages of any given technique and when you might want to use it. That was something that I, I learned a lot from this book about about techniques that you don't necessarily use the same technique every time you cast on with an edge. You don't, just because you like the long tail cast on doesn't mean you should always use it. So uh, that was been really helpful to me. Uh, it fits in your knitting, in your knitting uh, bag and um, it's, it can be really helpful. So I, when I was doing the master hand knitting program, I found this very useful up to about maybe the middle of level two. And then I didn't need it as much because I was really looking often for the best way to do something. But this has a lot to teach you about why and when you use specific techniques. Um, so that's really good. This book, The Knitter's Handbook, um, is it's probably the book that I still use the most. Like if I can't remember how to do something or if I'm like, is this the only way to, you know, are there, is there another way? If I just want to look in one source, I'll look in here. And then if I can't find it, then I'll start looking everywhere else. I mean, sometimes I, I open all my books and then I compare, well, what are they saying? What are they saying? What are they saying? Because they may not all have the same techniques. They may not all explain the same techniques in the same way. And they may not agree on which is the best technique. But this this book, it first of all, doesn't lie flat. So um, I need to get this change. What I do sometimes with my books that I want to use a lot and lay flat, like this book did not come with a spiral. I took it to Kinko's and had them chop the binding off and put a spiral on there. That way it will lay flat or you can flip it in half like this so that it will um, be more useful. So I've done that with my stitch dictionaries. I've done that with a few other books that I've used a lot. I haven't done it to this one and I don't know why, um, but I really should. But what's so great about this book is that it, it has like 20 or 30 different ways of casting on or binding off. When it explains decreases, 
it groups them or increases, it groups them together so that she tells you the right, le right leaning and the left leaning. And she tells you how to do it on the pearl side of the work as well. So like a central double decrease, for example, isn't really that hard. It's easy to get the hang of and, and execute once you understand what the steps are. But trying to do that from the pearl side, trying to figure out how to do that from the pearl side is like, uh, ridiculous because it's much more difficult, but she has it in here. So, uh, these, if the, if there are drawings, she will have one drawing. There's no photograph. Well, there's maybe in, in the middle, there's a couple of color photographs on a couple of pages. Well, actually I'm lying. There are color photographs uh, throughout, but not of the techniques. They usually have finished items to show examples of things. This book though is really, really good. Um, but again, if you're trying to look up a technique that, that you don't know how to do and you have a specific name for it, that can be a little tricky sometimes. So sometimes you have to go to that chapter. You have to figure out well, where is this being used in a garment or in a project. And you might have to think a little bit and be creative in your thinking when you're using the index. Now the last book, this big book of knitting, this is a book that people raved about and they said, oh, I use this a lot in level two for the master hand knitting program. Um, it's, I certainly didn't use it for level one. I did use it a bit for level two. Um, I didn't really understand how great this book was because it, it has, it's, it's just a little different. I mean, it, it like I'm opening up, it's got a thing about pockets here and it's got a, a, a section on um, hemming and, you know, all kinds of things that other books might have, but a lot of sometimes just presented in a different way. Um, and years ago when I had my knitting column on Ravelry in the This Week in Ravelry, somebody asked me a question. They were, they were using a pattern from Rebecca magazine, which is a German language magazine that, that now is also available in English, but, um, but she was knitting something that had a zipper, it was going to have a zipper installed. And then she didn't understand the instructions for the zipper facing. And I read through it and I wasn't quite sure either. So I got out, you know, some yarn and needles and I was able to figure out what was going on. I thought, well, that's interesting huh and I'd never seen anything like it and so I looked in all of my reference books about um, zipper facings and some of them might explain how to install a zipper um, but not none of them had that so that so Rebecca is a German mag knitting magazine um, and big book of knitting is translated from German this is an English book but it's translated from German this was the only book that had a zipper facing like that. It was, it was identical. The technique was slightly different. It was sort of like the difference between an SSK and an SKP decrease where they give you the same result, but they just get there in slightly different ways. Um, so it had a slightly different take on it. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. So I wrote an article uh, in the Ask a Knitter column, and then I did a little video that went along with it. And I thought, well, that's, then I started thinking, well, this is, book is, is kind of more interesting. And then I got to a point where um, I'd been using short rows and I hadn't understood them. I think it took me four years of using short rows in all sorts of different patterns for things to finally click with me like, oh, <laughs> okay, I get it. Um, Cause I always just had to trust the pattern and um, so it was a time when there were a lot of bloggers and people on Ravelry talking about different types of short row techniques besides wrap and turn, because a lot of people really don't like them, including me. I didn't like wrap and turn short rows. So I, I went th and so there were and a lot of people were really big on the Japanese short rows at that time. And I tried them and I, and I just did not have the patience for them. It was way too fiddly for me with the pins. There are ways of doing it without pins hanging down, which I didn't know. Um, but I was just looking for, let me, let me go through all my books, set on the floor, all the books open a short row section, and I'll just read through and see um, what they say. And so the, the 
books that were originally written in English all had wrap and turn, and I believe some of them may have also had the yarn over method um, in there. Um, then I looked in the big book of knitting, and it had two methods of short rows. Now, the thing about my understanding about German knitting instructions, just based on um, what German knitters have said, and my experience with translated instructions, both in this book and then like when I have had a, a pattern that was only in German that I trans, that, you know, work to translate into English, that they don't necessarily have um, names or labels for a specific technique that they then abbreviate. So like I was just talking about the SSK decrease, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a decrease with that label. Um, in fact, a lot of times the instructions are so terse, they just tell you to decrease whether they want you to actually work two stitches together or bind off eight of them. They use the same word. So, so it's a little different. So they'll be describing something and then you have to figure out, well, oh, that they're talking about a make one increase, but they don't call it that. They just explain what they want you to do. So in this book, they had two types of short row uh, techniques. One of them was called shorten rows with yarn over. So I'm like, okay, so that's a yarn over short row. And then the other one was called shortened rows with stitches passed over. And I'm like, well, what how is that different than yarn over passed over? You know, I didn't quite get it. And I couldn't really understand what was going on from the pictures. It didn't look like anything in any of the other books. So I just got out yarn and needles and I tried it and I could and it has a lot of photographs like it's just got tons of photographs like it's got both drawing and then a photograph next to it of both things so whichever one helps you and then it has results so I had as a result of the short row in uh, one color and then in um, two colors in the contrast so that you can actually see what was going on so I thought well this is great and so but I'm like well what's it called because obviously an American or someone who speaks English and knits in English isn't going to call it that. They're going to have a name for it. And so I didn't know how to look it up. I didn't know how to look it up. It wasn't in any of my other knitting books. And so then I would go on blog tutorials looking where they were comparing different short row techniques. Couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And eventually I realized, you know, this, this sounds like what they're talking about on when you have German sock yarn, you like Regia or Opal or uh, Mail Invite or something like that. Sometimes you'll see uh, if you take the yarn label off on the back of the yarn label, there'll be a um, a pattern for a sock, the sock pattern, and it'll have it'll be a short row heel. And I'm like, oh, this is that same short row that they're describing in that pattern. But since I didn't knit short row heels because they didn't fit me, I never had tried it. And I thought, okay, so I've only seen this short row in, in patterns or books that have been translated from German. And I could tell that the result was the same as a Japanese short row. So I thought, well, so, and I was going to write a column for Ask a Knitter in This Week in Ravelry. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just call it German short rows because that makes sense. And um, so I wrote the column. I did a little video on it. This was like May, I don't even know what year. It was in May of whatever year that was. And then, um, but the editor was a new volunteer editor and it just took, you know, it, it, everything was volunteer. So it took till October before the article came out. And then that was the last issue of This Week in Ravelry. And so that was the article where I wrote about German short rows. And um, so thank goodness that that um, article came out because people love German short rows. But so this book is responsible <laughs> for me writing that column and doing that original video and um, videos and and everything since then. And so it's it's a really remarkable book. It has different things in it than what's in other books. So, oh, 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 Principles of Knitting, one more, because somebody asked about that. So this is like huge, huge book. And this is meant to be comp very comprehensive as well. I, I do use this when I look things up in every 
in every book or if like the if the knitter's handbook doesn't have have it in there then I start like well who, who does have this in here and then I'll look in this one the the problem with this book for me is that she recognizes there's a lot of ambiguity in knitting terms like you'll have one technique that can have multiple names and you can have one label for a technique that could be used for multiple techniques so that gets confusing so if you were to you know she were to name you say here's how you do a make one increase well there's you know a couple of different ways of doing make one increases and then sometimes people just say make one when they want you to do whatever increase you want to do yourself so that's ambiguous so rather than picking one and saying, you know, that's also known as this or that or the other thing, she just came up with her own unique names for things that would identify that technique um, in a very specific way, which makes it hard to look up. So you have to go into the chapter and you have to read through. So it's a very different sort of reference book. Um, then and to be fair a lot of them are this way is that you kind of have to know what you want to do and then look well what do they say my options are for doing this um i would say uh the knitter's book of finishing techniques is probably the one that's most likely to be useful if you're just trying to look up a technique um and you have a name for the technique then you're mo more likely um to have success. So these other books are really good if you are kind of wanting to do your own modifications or your own design or just wanting to understand more by reading through them instead of just looking one specific thing up. So uh, so those are my thoughts on general knitting reference books. Uh, I do think they're really important. I didn't know how important they were um, and what I could learn from them until I was required to have uh, a, a general knitting reference book or two. So, um, so that's it for today. And thanks for watching. And I'll see you next week.